Welcome to the fourth video in our Focus for Women's Health curriculum. As a reminder, during our last lesson, we talked about the limited second and third trimester ultrasound, where we talked about determining the fetal lie and presentation. We talked about an introduction to multiple gestations and trying to figure out the uh, amnionicity and chorionicity of our multiple pregnancies. We talked about the preference for the deepest vertical pocket when assessing the fluid status. We looked at placentation and identified some of the ways that the placenta can cause some pathology if it's located in a bad position inside the uterus covering the internal cervical os along the placenta previa spectrum. We talked about measuring baby using fetal biometry. And lastly, we had a quick little introduction into sex determination using ultrasound. Today, we're going to be talking about other findings in pregnancy. And this is just a quick section that deals with some of the other findings you may run into when scanning patients with positive pregnancy tests. Now, this is a big topic, and this is just going to be an introduction to these findings, all of which can be delved into with much more depth in the advanced OB module that will be a part of our elective curriculum. So while I don't expect all of our residents to master these specific scanning skills, I would expect our OB high trackers and any other resident planning to practice independently in obstetrics or obstetrical ultrasound to show familiarity with these topics. First up, while we generally expect healthy and happy outcomes with our pregnant patients, the reality is that for both predictable and uncertain reasons, some early conceptions result in non-viable gestations, or some otherwise viable gestations do not progress through the first trimester. Terminology varies and has thankfully been moving to more patient-centered language in recent years, but all of the above are terms used to describe some of the following findings. So here we have some images of uh, various failed pregnancies or um, failing pregnancies. So we have an anagram pregnancy up here in the left-hand corner. And if you remember back from our first trimester video, we talked about how using the size of our gestational sac um, and not having a, a fetal pole on the inside can be diagnostic of a, uh, an embryonic pregnancy. And so in this case, we see a, a sac that's certainly greater than 25 millimeters in average dimension, um, and there's no fetal pole or yolk sac to be seen on the inside. Down here we have a missed abortion, so this is where we can see a fetal pole, but unfortunately there was no cardiac activity noted uh, for this particular product of conception. Um, and the cervix, which is located down here on this transvaginal view, is closed, and so this is a, a missed abortion. And then up here, uh, this is a patient who presented with um, vaginal bleeding after a positive home pregnancy test. Um, and the inside of the uterus on this view is noted to be um, thickened with some uh, heterogeneous material on the inside, um, but no viable pregnancy. Um, and so I like to think of these findings as existing on a spectrum of both space and time, because with conservative management, most of these findings will result in the same at outcome, which is ultimately passage of the products of conception often in the clinical setting of abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, or contractions. While early pregnancy losses before 20 weeks can often be managed conservatively and at home, there are some situations where medical management or surgical management or even elective hospitalization might be indicated for the patient who experiences one of these. So make sure that you read up on the individual findings that you run across. At its simplest, the diagnosis of an early pregnancy loss can refer to failure to see a viable fetus after a certain time frame or a certain growth parameter has been reached, failure to see cardiac activity after it was previously seen, or unidentifiable contents inside the uterus with a positive pregnancy test. Now, you do also need to think about ectopics or gestational trophoblastic disease, um, but those are the general findings that you might see. Next up, let's talk about subchorionic hemorrhages. One of the most common findings seen in early pregnancy is a subchorionic hemorrhage. And this refers to the visualization of new or chronic appearing blood collections at the border of the chorionic membrane. This blood can appear completely anechoic when fresh, but older bleeds will also have some echogenic components as well. The significance of subchorionic hemorrhages aren't fully understood. 
we know that small ones don't seem to be related to any difference in, in perinatal outcomes, but ones that are much larger, uh, including if they involve greater than 50% of the circumference of the gestational sac, are associated with a higher risk of miscarriage. Next, let's talk about the corpus luteum cyst. So the corpus luteum is a normal structure that arises within the ovary as a temporary endocrine structure, which its main function is to secrete progesterone and estrogen at sufficient enough levels to support the zygote and early embryo until implantation and placentation can take over. A corpus luteum cyst, uh, when it's visualized, usually ranges in size from two to three centimeters, uh, maybe even up to five centimeters in size, which can rival the size of normal ovarian tissue. While not all corpus luteums become cystic, many do. And while this doesn't usually cause any issues, very large cysts, um, sometimes even up in size to 10 centimeters, can result in some twisting or impingement or disruption of the blood supply to the ovary, resulting in ovarian torsion or similar symptoms. Relevant to this lecture, the diagnosis for a corpus luteum cyst is often marred by dangerous findings such as an ectopic pregnancy in younger women. So while the corpus luteum cyst and tubal ring sign can appear similar, there's a few things of, uh, that you can, kind of rules of thumb, I guess, to, to uh, note. Nine times out of 10, ectopic pregnancies will be more echogenic than the surrounding tissue in the adnexo, particularly than the ovarian tissue, whereas corpus luteum cyst rings are often iso or hypoechoic relative to the ovary. Seeing ovarian tissue also helps uh, because if you see a, a circular structure embedded inside the ovary, it's much more likely that it could be a corpus luteum cyst or an ovarian cyst um, and not a ectopic pregnancy, although these certainly can still occur. When in doubt, I lean on dynamic ultrasonography in a bimanual exam to help determine if the ring I'm seeing is in the ovary or if it moves separate from the ovary. Another much less common finding exists with uterine perforation or rupture. Uterine rupture is a rare but potentially devastating event. While ultrasound is not typically used to make the diagnosis antepartum and intrapartum, um, because in that case you'd you know, be loss of fetal station, severe belly pain, that kind of stuff, um, there are some case studies that show postpartum diagnoses, and that's what we've, we've seen here. Uh, the orientation here is a little bit confusing. I think that this is a transvaginal probe with a retroflex uterus, and that's the reason why the fundus is over on this side, but uh, I don't know for sure. Um, but at any rate, we can see that this is a, you know, a, a uterine myometrium, um, and then we've got this endometrial section here and a hypoechoic linear structure that sort of extends from the uh, uterine cavity all the way to the external surface of the uterus um, and the rest of the body. Uh, and this is uh, very similar to how other muscular tears will look in the body. Um, so I'll show you a picture here of a supraspinatus tear up in the shoulder. Um, and you can see how similar these different uh, hypoechoic tears look. So here we see the same thing. We see muscle here and then a hypoechoic uh, kind of structure with some fluid that's built up there um, that's, that's interrupting the relatively homogeneous appearance of the muscle. And so you can see that just remembering the uterus is a big muscle, that's how it would look similarly. Placental abruption is often something that's talked about in the OB wards and in uh, patients who present with belly pain in a positive pregnancy test, um, and oftentimes our instinct is to get an ultrasound to assess it. However, you cannot make a diagnosis of placental abruption based on an ultrasound. While ultrasound can confirm findings if you suspect something in an otherwise stable patient and end up getting an ultrasound, the lack of a visualized abruption does not rule it out. If you think a patient could be abrupting, you have to treat them as such. This is not a situation where point of care ultrasound has been found to be helpful, at least so far in the evidence we have available to us. Next, let's talk about gestational trophoblastic disease. Gestational trophoblastic disease refers to a number of diagnoses caused by abnormal proliferation of trophoblastic material inside the uterus. This can range from a collection of pre-embryonic tissues to invasive malignant disease. The common names for the typical subset of these, in, these conditions, molar pregnancies, comes from the Latin, the Latin word mola, which refers to like a millstone, 
and also a false conception. And I don't really know how these words are related, um, but it is a sort of interesting uh, nugget of wisdom that's lost to time. At any rate, the weirdness of the etymology begets the still currently weirder named molar pregnancy, which is described as having a snowstorm appearance on ultrasound, which you can see here, the sort of cobblestone looking snowstorm appearance, um, also known as a cluster of grapes appearance. You can see sort of that looks like a little bit of a cluster of grapes coming down here. Um, these will generally fill the uterus and they often require active management uh, to resolve once they're identified. Next, let's talk about cervical insufficiency. So screening for cervical uh, insufficiency is um, somewhat uh, of an art um, in many ways. The Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine Doctors recommends screening with vaginal ultrasound uh, at 16 to 24 weeks in all patients who have a history of spontaneous preterm birth. And ACOG also recommends screening uh, for any patient without a specific time declaration with serial ultrasounds for any patient that has a history of a spontaneous preterm birth. But they also recommend screening at least once in all pregnancies um, just to look at the uh, length of the cervix. A cervical screen where the cervix measures at or less than 25 millimeters or 2.5 centimeters in length should raise suspicions for cervical insufficiency. Um, and the cutoff for this has changed over the years, but uh, lengths up to and including 25 millimeters are currently defined by the SMFM and ACOG as being insufficient. The image checklist to get an appropriate image for this is to have the patient empty their bladder as we would for just about all uh, transvaginal ultrasounds. We make a straight line measurement from the internal to the external os. So even if the, um, even if the cervix is somewhat curved, we generally make a straight line measurement or if you want to, you can take one turn within the cervix and take two measurements, but you shouldn't take more than that. So up here we see we see one segment here and one segment there. It would be appropriate to also just measure from here to here, which you would know would be a shorter measurement and thus a, a more positive screen. Um, but as a screening test, that's what we want is we want um, tests that are going to be more positive than not uh, to help us rule in pathology. Uh, it's good practice to take an average of a couple of different measurements. Um, and then if you're really assessing or really concerned, you can take a, a gentle um, fundal pressure and place a, a little bit of pressure on the baby's head or the, the gravid abdomen to try to um, bulge these membranes down. What we see is a normal progression is that you have a T sign here where there's sort of no encroachment of amniotic fluid uh, into the cervical canal. Uh, and with time that becomes more funneling and eventually a U-shaped um, protrusion of these membranes into the cervix as that uh, cervix gets thinner and thinner and less and less competent. So those are a uh, quick summary of some of the other findings that we'll see sometimes in pregnancy. Uh, like I said, this is just an introduction and for more information, uh, you'll, I encourage you to, to check out some of our advanced OB techniques, which you will find in our ultrasound curriculum.